Welcome to the Jockey Club, a podcast looking at the movie Let It Ride, one scene at a time. My name is Dan Delgado, and we're at historic Hylia Park where one man is having the best day of his life. I'm having a good day. So come on in and hang out while we talk about this day and the greatest movie of all time, Let It Ride. Don't worry about that guy at the door. I've got you covered. You can even take my seat to the jockey club. Welcome back to the jockey club. This episode, we're discussing the fourth scene of Let It Ride. This is where Trotter and Looney first enter the bar around 11 minutes and 19 seconds into the movie, and the scene ends around 15 minutes and 22 seconds if you're keeping score at home. Joining me at my usual table is the writer of the official Netflix DVD blog and the host of the Cinema Shame podcast, a man with three first names, Mr. James David Patrick, who does list Let It Ride among his top five movie favorites. So come on, take your seat, and let's dive into this scene. We're going to be discussing scene four, or as I have it listed as scene four. But James, what I would love to hear from you is, can you tell me about the, since this is your first time doing this with me, can you tell me about the first time that you saw this movie? The first time that I saw this movie would have been on VHS. I'm quite certain that I didn't get to see it in the theater that summer because I remember pretty vividly what I saw that summer of 1989 because I'm actually writing a much longer manuscript about the summer of 1989 and I had a and I try to piece together my (laughs) entire whereabouts for those three or four months. And no matter how hard I tried to wish it into existence, I did not see this movie in the theater. Well, you're not alone on that one, so don't feel too no. bad about it, I guess. No, but at that point, I was a Richard Dreyfus fan, so it would have been an immediate rental when it came out on VHS. And did it have a, an immediate impact where you were, oh, I absolutely love this movie, or did that take some time? How long before, as you told me before I started recording, that you were obsessed it was right away. I remember renting it and it was one of the movies that you watched again. You know, there's, there's a handful of those. I don't know how people don't really have this experience anymore. And I think that's kind of sad where you, where you go to the video store on Friday, you check out a whole mess of tapes and you watch them all weekend. And, you know, normally they get, they get a play and they go back on Sunday or Monday or whenever you're, whenever your tapes are due. But it was those those few rare ones where, like, I I have this for another day. I'm going to watch that again, and it was just it was just a movie that that hit me. And I didn't I had been to a racetrack, so I think there may have been some appeal there. I, I had I'd been to Keeneland in Kentucky um, probably the year before, so that may have fueled some of the interest in the activity of gambling. Like having seen it firsthand and witnessed some of these characters that, mm-hmm. that, you know, it is sort of a different lifestyle, a different world among them. And you don't have to be too old to recognize that these are not your average human. Oh, yeah. Yeah, most definitely. I was I was not quite 15 when I saw this. I don't think I had been to the track. I can tell you that I did go to the track shortly thereafter, though. Like me and my brother, I want to say within... It's possible it was within weeks, but it, it definitely happened within the next few months. He was old enough to, to be buying tickets and gambling. I was not, obviously. But nonetheless, the, the, the movie had it. Not that I became some sort of gambler because of the movie, but I did feel the need to go and experience the track. And unfortunately, I did not. I, I had every opportunity. I think about it now. I had every opportunity to go to the track that they went to, Hialeah. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, I thought the movie must have been filmed at Gulfstream, which is another track here in South Florida, which is where I live. And that's where I went. And for a long time, I thought the movie was filmed at Gulfstream. And here I am like, yeah, this was, yeah, the jockey club's got to be right over there. You know, I'm looking around thinking, no, no, you're completely wrong. You're completely wrong. But OK, so and the, and the betting, not to get too to get too far into this particular segment, but the. 
having, I obviously wasn't old enough at the time to place my own bets, but I was feeding my bets to my dad who was placing bets and whatever I came up with was good enough. And I'm the, the lunatic that's like, I'm going to pick whatever horse to place, right? <laughs> you know, I get the place vibe from this horse. It wasn't, I wasn't just picking winners. I was like somehow divining where they're going to land. And it wasn't like I was hedging my bets. It was like trying to get that, that minor payoff from, from getting the, picking the, the horse that wins by, by hitting in place. I was like, this horse is going to be second. And like, I won a couple bets. You know, you, you get that taste. It was like, I can see why people love this activity. <laughs> Did it make you any kind of a gambler? Did you go on any kind of consistent basis at all? Like once you became of age? No. Okay. So it did not have that sort of an influence on you. I think I've only been to one other racetrack since. Oh, no kidding. Okay. Yeah. Like it didn't, I guess it's just because I didn't have, nobody really wanted to go to a racetrack, you know, like, and I didn't live in areas. It was a, a abundantly accessible. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if I, I had good. been, if I had been like in Florida and Kentucky and it was like, you know, just around the corner. I'm sure I could have marshaled up enough people to hop over to the racetrack. And and I probably would have been more invested in it. And you know, like the thought, thinking about it now, I'm like, yeah, that sounds like fun. Let's go. Every and I, I had wanted to go to Kentucky recently because of my my daughter's soccer. They play in Cincinnati quite frequently. And they also play a Kentucky team. So I'm like, we can just hop over. I mean, there's enough time. Just, just You're just going to go and watch. And, right. and really... I think, and this for me, I'm going to guess this is the same for you, what's going on around not just the race and the gambling, but watching the people who were there, like the people watching, is kind of what I was more interested in. So we have, well, sort of, uh, highlight here, right? And, yeah. and certainly back in the late 80s and, and 90s was much more prevalent, and I went to that quite a bit. But I did not gamble when I was there. I was... And I was always invested in what are, what are all these people doing? Like, like the people watching and I'm looking for the kinds of characters that we're going to talk about who are popping up mm -hmm. in this very scene, this fourth scene, which is at, at the bar. Like I'm looking for those kinds of, of people and just sort of trying to, to kind of take them in. Yeah. The, the, I mean, for people who like to maybe to, to spread this out, uh, relate it to something every day, the, the mall watch that happens, like all the people at the mall. Like you go there and there's there's a certain type. There's cliques and gangs and types of people that are in the mall. And they're minorly fascinating. And as a writer, I think I take more interest in this than the average human, perhaps. And like I like observing people. Yes. It's doing something that's you know a little bit eccentric, a little bit unusual, and they think it's perfectly normal. And like those are the types of people that I'm, I'm really interested in as character building. Like these are the ones that fuel the good stuff. The racetrack is like a mecca for that type of person. There yeah. are so many types and so many eccentrics and they, they're going about what they do every day. And, and it's just another Tuesday. Yeah, that's exactly it right there. All right. So ready to talk about scene four from Let It Ride. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to try to break it down and any thoughts, comments that you have, just go ahead and toss them in. All right. right, will do. All right, so this is where they head into the bar, which may or may not be known as the Lucky Horseshoe Cafe. I am only calling it that, and you already know why. It's based on mm -hmm. that promo picture that you see of Richard Dreyfuss and David Johansson, and they're smiling, and you see the big sign for the bar. But I don't believe the bar ever, the name ever comes up in the movie. I, I could be wrong about that, but I, you certainly don't see it when they go in. They just cross the street, and then they're inside the bar. They're inside the bar. It's called Marty's in the script. You know, oh, look Marty at that. Is the, is the the bartender. So that's how I've I've known it because I, I did pick up the script at some point, and uh, so in my head it's Marty's too. No, Marty's makes way more sense than Lucky <laughs> Horseshoe Cafe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, for forever, I wanted to know where this bar was, and so I thought it was across the street from Hialeah Park, which it's not. It's uh, somewhere else. But I did look around Hialeah Park one time looking for this bar that is not there. Anyway, How the magic of movie making. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. When when I was watching, you know, when you watch the DVD, and I think in the Pitka interview, he explains how they just put up gates 
for when they're crossing the street to the bar. So it looks like the track is behind you, but it's not. <laughs> and I was like, oh, man, God, I'm so unbelievably naive and foolish. Anyway, so as they're walking in, entering the bar, you see, this is where we first see Vibes. He is staring into space. Looney is trying to get his attention. Trotter takes a seat, and he pulls out the racing form. And we start looking at... I, I did not notice... There's so many things that you just don't notice, even though I have seen this movie a number of times. But now that I'm doing this, and I'm looking at it way more, and maybe you already know some of these things because you've read the script, but I did not notice the horse that was named Low Fat, even though it actually gets mentioned in this scene. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I hadn't noticed that. Like Just like quick little mentions that... I don't know, maybe you, you, you pick up or you don't. Like, if I told you that that's the horse that Vibes like was, was named Low Fat, would you have known that? Not, in separate, not until I read the script. Okay. So. Because when I, 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 I remember that. When I read the script, I was like, Low Fat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. So then, oh, yeah. I, you know, I watched the movie. So I picked up the script a little while ago when I did the Cinema Shame podcast for Let It Ride. And I was like, oh, it, you know, it wouldn't hurt to just uh, to find the script and, and just give it a read through. Because I, I love reading scripts for, for movies I know really well. And how different was the script from what the finished film is? I don't know if this, the, the script I was able to get a hold of, I, it's definitely not a shooting script. Okay. And I'm Even not better. sure it's the last script before it, there's a lot of changes that happen. And I know there are reshoots too, that aren't in this script because the opening scene was a reshoot, a last minute reshoot in the Chinese food restaurant mm -hmm. that was added when Paramount told Joe Pickett he didn't like his movie. So between that and the release, which was also pushed up a month that was added. And that's not in the script. The, nope. The, the relationship ad. The, I'm sorry, the relationship ad? Well, he... Oh, the, oh I see what you're no, saying. At, at, the, at the beginning yeah. of the movie. Yeah, that first Yeah. Time. Sure, yeah. The, his wife is hardly involved. Huh. You know, I, I think about that when... I, we, you know, I've already... We did an episode talking about that first scene. And yet, without that first scene, there's so much less of Terry Gar. Right. And I guess... I mean, I'm not familiar with the casting of Terry Gar. I, I don't know when she was added because it does seem like sort of a lesser role yeah. for her. But that said, she's really an essential component of why this movie works as well as it does. Oh, absolutely. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. And it's funny because if you have the DVD that came out last year where it has that original first scene of, of Trotter at the Gamblers Anonymous meeting... That's a great scene. But I do love the scene at the Chinese restaurant. Mm -hmm. To me, that scene sets up whatever else happens in the movie so well, I would hate to, to lose that, you know? And I think we're talking about this, our scene that we're looking at currently. Mm -hmm. the, the Chinese food conversation really is a good precursor to some of the ritual and I, sort of spiritual connections they have to gambling i mean the fortune cookie is really sort of a type of gambling and there are rules and ethics involved in as much as they're funny and eccentric like this is serious mm -hmm. and and that scene with the with, in the chinese food restaurant with the fortune cookie kind of sets that in motion and we get a whole dose of it when they first get into the bar yeah yeah you're absolutely right because everybody's in their own ritual. Like Vibes is over there. He's divining horses and numbers and whatever else pops into his brain. And he's explaining how that happens. And, you know, they're, they're all starting to detail how they bet and why they bet. And that's as personal as any other trait that they have. That initial scene you're talking about that was cut with the Gamblers Anonymous mm -hmm. in the script. It's a huge chunk of the beginning and it's a really different feel when you're going through the the pace of the screenplay the whole thing takes forever to get to the racetrack and i was looking at that and you know you're wondering when these choices are made and why they're made right and i at this point i think i'm crediting joe pitka for the way this movie moves absolutely 
because it moves. It does. It's it's bam, 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 scene, 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 and the camera's moving. And it, it and the whole thing is about motion and momentum and rolling downhill towards this epic finale. And being the music video director that he was, I mean, that's that's how he operates. Mm-hmm. So this, what's I think it, I feel like it's like a ten page scene that oh, wow. opens. In, I mean, it, it it goes on. I mean, the dialogue is 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 a lot. And so this probably has, were they, you know, it's so rare that I sort of feel like I would side with a studio choice, but I really love that Chinese restaurant scene and would hate to lose it. Despite what I, I would too. I mean, when you read this, did you look at it as though, oh, this is a, I don't want to say a momentum killer because it hasn't started yet, but this is a bit of a dirge. I mean, one of the things that maybe you don't want to think about too much is the actual effects of gambling on these people's lives. And Mm -hmm. even when you watch it on that deleted scene, you know, Trotter is getting his 30 day chip. And so you knowing already what happens with the rest of this film, which sort of feels like an endorsement for reckless gambling. It seems as though this scene is a little out of place with the, I don't know, gambler's fantasy that is about to come after it. (laughs) Yeah, it would definitely weigh the movie down. And it's, that's not what it's about, really. I think that's part of why it's, it works too. I mean, you know, there are, there is a type of gambling, alcoholic addiction movie. And that's, I feel like that's 99% of all those movies. Mm Mm-hmm. And then there's Let It Ride. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. And part of the appeal of the movie is that the little guy, the the put-upon schlub, the the nobody, has one phenomenal day. And that's, I mean, I I don't want to make it sound like it's so simplistic, but Mm -hmm. that's kind of the appeal of the movie is that it does subvert our expectation for the genre oh yeah absolutely i can remember i can remember the the first time that i saw this which was when it opened and thinking he was going to lose that last race well you're you you assume you're trained to expect him to lose everything absolutely yeah he's pushing it too hard he's pushing it too far he's gonna lose this last one and what what wait what has happened there's no lesson to be learned here. What are we doing? Yeah. It, it, it completely subverts your expectations. Part of what makes you love it so much, I think. It does, you know, it, it dips a toe into the gambling is bad. The movie, <laughs> you know. The, <laughs> it, it does. You know, it, it's funny. While I'm, I'm so entertained by all of the people in this bar, I don't want to be any of them. No. Like, I never actually started. <laughs> get, I just wanted to look at them and kind of gawk at them. But I, I never desired to hang out with Vibes or Marty or Cheeseburger or any of these people because it's like, yeah, you know, you don't want to turn into a cartoon character, you know? And, well, and that you could say cartoon or Runyon S. Runyon S. Runyon S. Sure, little, take some of the the cartoon out of it when you, when you give it a guys and dolls spin because it I, really is. It, there is a lot of that, and I think there's even more of it in the screenplay. All right, so let's move along with the with the scene here. All right. Right. Okay. So we're looking at our race form 40 to one. I love this little shot of the race form charity, the little, the line next to it, not in this lifetime. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and immediately as, as Trotter is looking at this and thinking about, Oh, look at the potential here. Looney <laughs> it says could be a late scratch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> He's already negative about the proceedings here. Even though, he, he like us, he, he knows how it ends too. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> I guess so, right? Because Trotter has just, well, you know what? I guess Looney was, is still thinking that maybe this were two people who were rehearsing for a play. I mean, maybe he's still going with that thought process. Right. <laughs> even though Trotter just gave him some money to go gamble, yep. and, and Looney's going to decide. He, he likes decides, the Packers. He likes the Packers. <laughs> He'll bet a half on the Packers. Maybe they don't lose so bad. And... I, I, we cannot not mention how disgusting the television is in this bar. It is quite possibly the worst-looking television I've ever seen, and 
Certainly not for one that would be to, hey, come come to my bar to watch this television. It's behind actual bars, mm -hmm. and it's so disgustingly dirty. It's just sort of like a, a mosaic that's moving around instead of uh, whatever football game you're supposed to be watching. You can still see the numbers in the horses, so it's okay. <laughs> so Marty comes over. Marty, the bartender, played by uh, Ed Walsh. Two people from California split here. We've got Ed Walsh. We've got also Joseph Walsh, relatives. And Marty comes over and announces, hey, listen, my 40 stars. I haven't put up a 40 star system and I don't I'm not sure how long it's been in eight years, whatever it's been. Normally, I think it's a 32. Now it's a 40 star system, James. So be excited about this. Mm -hmm. He likes the number seven horse. And his reasoning ultimately is that you've got a foreign jockey and an American horse. Right. You know, there's bound to be some <laughs> a communication <laughs> gap. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that's going to help. <laughs> what, what I love about this, this particular exchange, is that you could watch this movie 10 times and not even recognize what he's talking about. Oh, for it's sure. almost not even focused. It's the only dialogue in this particular segment, but it's sort of Altman at this moment. This is when we first start to feel the overlapping dialogue and the camera not focusing on the speaker mm -hmm. and you're just sort of taking in the ambiance of Marty's. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, there's all kinds of other voices that you're hearing in the background, all kinds of other things that are happening. This is where Vibes mentions that he all right, he likes the eight horse, right? He, he tells yep. Marty, no, you're wrong. It's going to be the number eight horse. But then that's where he men someone mentions that it's low fat. That's the name. And some, I think someone says, what is that, milk? And yeah. So anyway, he likes it based uh, on the number eight, which is what has vibed into his brain. Uh, I love the little joke of that vibe states that he would bet his life on it. And Trotter mentions that now there's a $2 minimum, which, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's one of those jokes that I, it took, I probably watched it a few times before I caught that as a solid, really funny little toss away joke. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, the whole scene is like that, and that I was yes. I, I I mean I love this scene, and I was so happy that you asked me to talk about this particular scene because it it is all of that, and it's it's you know it representative of pieces of the other movie too, of the rest of the movie, and this is how I mean this is where it all begins, where we're, our expectations are set up for the the next I guess they're at seventy five minutes or so at this point, yeah, and, and some of the the way the movie builds starts right here with the way this dialogue builds upon each other and the overlapping conversations. And it really is kind of a treat to, to watch this movie over and over again over the years. And it wasn't until I watched it two or three times recently that I even picked up on the, the what is it, milk, the low fat, like this actually being a piece of dialogue in the movie. Mm. I honestly don't know what I was paying attention to the other times I've seen it. That's right. That's right. Yes. It's, it's not as though you're not watching it and listening what's happening, but those right. lines are, are very quick and they're almost spoken in a, in a subtle way. Like, like, I don't know. They're, they're just, they just seem kind of small. And unless you're really tuned in, it's just going to go by so fast, I think. And I think part of it is because Trotter's not paying attention, really. I mean, he's sort of tuned in, but not really. He's in his own head at this yes. point already. He walks in and he's asking for aspirin and Maalox, and he's he's not 100% paying attention to all of the conversations. And the the volume of the conversation raises and lowers as he tunes in and out of the conversations. So so I think we're sort of in his headspace here. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, and we're also really kind of taking in Marty's because it's going to be such a nice juxtaposition when we get to the jockey club later on, like the two mm -hmm. different worlds, like the, the world of this place, which is a fun world, but probably doesn't smell very good. Mm, and, this is the 99%. Oh, yes, that's correct. And eventually, <laughs> we're going to get to the one. Yep. <laughs> so we also get to hear vibe, Vibes explain how he gets his picks. It, it's a little hard for me to believe. He's explaining it to Looney. It's a little hard for me to believe that, that these people have obviously known each other for a while, have, must be interacting constantly, right? At some point, Vibes must have explained how he operates, how he clears his mind of everything. 
and <laughs> it pops in. But mm -hmm. he's gonna tell Looney anyway. Looney's gonna be right. like, "What? I don't know. like like he doesn't know this about him." I have a feeling <laughs> it's the kind of thing everybody would know about him. His name is Vibes, right? right? Yeah. But then this is where Trotter really spaces out. Like he's oh, totally yeah. checked out for when Looney is talking to Vibes here. Yes, and and he's just sort of uh, observing everybody and getting more and more depressed as he looks around the bar mm -hmm. at what he sees and all of the people and eventually <laughs> eventually he has a vision about his life it, it's it was going down the drain mm -hmm. which vibes says god it's so dumb this is such a dumb thing to say that don't you realize you just had a minor vibe <laughs> on a horse the number six horse sink or swim <laughs> <laughs> Going back to the screenplay for this particular yeah. scene, it's such a it's such a little thing. So yeah. right after right after this scene, when Charter Space is out and he's he's watching his he's seeing his life go down the toilet, and he kind of snaps out of him and he says, "Oh God!" and and heads off towards the the toilet. Right. That piece of dialogue was moved from later. The conversation continues, and this is like six or seven lines down, and it's so perfect and effective there like his moment of realization when it happens here mm. when Looney says what's wrong after the oh god like the oh god sets off the rest of this scene and when it's later it's kind of an aside and it, it doesn't he's already kind of declared his his life is going down the drain the oh god seems superfluous and then he you know he's in the by that time he, then he's in the next step he's in the bathroom but moving that oh god, which is such it's such a little thing, up just a little bit, mm -hmm. sort of catalyzes what happens in the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. Like the realization, oh god, it's apropos nothing. It's not involved in any of the conversation. It's him in his own headspace coming out of it. Like I can't believe this happening around me is my life. It's sort of it, it, it's it's Trotter acting on these feelings right now and that's how it carries the rest of the film is him acting so the movement of the oh god i just i thought was a very interesting because why move it right oh yeah because it's not even the way it's edited it is like they moved this tiny little piece this tiny little piece of dialogue and it maybe this is just because i've, I've dabbled in screenplays and, and and written a few stinkers myself but when you see something like that mm -hmm. in the movie in as it functions, like how the blueprint becomes the film. It's, it's, I find it supremely interesting the way dialogue, something as small as that, can make such a huge impact just with a little bit of rejigger. Mm -hmm. And then he's going to go into the bathroom and, and talk to God. And talk to God. Yeah. Right. It makes perfect sense. So that is supposed to happen after he comes out of the bathroom? The, the dialogue is supposed to happen later. There's a little bit of dialogue that goes, but it's moved up. They have the sink or swim, sink, drain, goes together, vibes talk. Happens after, happens before the oh god. Ah, uh, okay. Got it's, it. It's just moved up before that conversation with the vibes. Okay, gotcha. So that happens as he's going. So it, it keeps the scene moving. It's that awkward flow in and out of Trotter's attention. Mm -hmm. And the way it works now, he snaps out of it. And then the vibes, the sink or swim, which is the dialogue that is really brought to the foreground because he's again in the moment and paying attention. Mm. So we get the tail end of that conversation after he's lucid. And and lucid as in like you hear right. it yes. fully on the soundtrack. Yes, yes, because when he's when he, we should point out, I mean, I'm, I'm presuming anyone who's going to listen to this already knows some of these things that we're talking about. I would hope so. Right? Otherwise, like, where, why are you doing? Right? Yeah. No, no, I got to listen to the fourth <laughs> one. I got to find out what happens next in right. this movie that I <laughs> that I'm still waiting on seeing. Right. <laughs> All right. So anyway, he heads into the bathroom. I love the shot that he goes just directly into the bathroom and then into the stall. It's just one fluid motion. I don't know that I would just push right into a stall the way he does uh, without no i, I look sure. at that toilet i look right? at that toilet all the time i'm like uh yeah maybe not <laughs> right yeah he just like it's like it's nothing i'm just gonna yep uh, going right into this one pushes right in yep <laughs> and 
this is where, well, actually, you know, he goes in first, and then we have Sid, Ralph Seymour enters with Evangeline, Cynthia Nixon, and yep. he starts introducing her to everyone. And here's Looney, here's Marty, here's Vibes, where's Trotter? Which is interesting because, you know, in that first scene, the deleted scene, the one at the Gambler's Anonymous, he's on his 30-day chip, which would let you know he probably has not been to the track for 30 days, right? Yeah. So I would think that Sid would have, if, if that scene's still there, maybe you would not necessarily expect Trotter to be there. Since I'm just presuming they're there all, like these guys are showing up all the time. What do you think? Again, I, I mean, I don't want to keep harping on the screenplay because I did. <laughs> no, okay, harp on it constantly. <laughs> this is great information. So I don't know this. I need to know it. Evangeline and Sid come in later when Trotter's already out of the bathroom in this version of the screenplay. Huh. Okay. So the "Where's Trotter?" is an added piece of dialogue because they come in when he's in the toilet. It, yes. I mean, this scene is really cut down a little bit towards the end of it. Like the beginning of it is pretty much bam, 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 bam. But some of the circuity is brought out of the end. Um, So why do you think, well, I'm sorry. So let me ask when Sid comes in and in the screenplay and Trotter is present, is that scene play out differently? Because the way that we have it in the movie, Trotter does not interact with Sid and Evangeline in this scene. There's extra dialogue between random people in the bar and Looney. Okay. But there isn't much. I'd have to. I don't think there's any interaction between Sid and Evangeline and Trotter. Okay. They come in. They come in right before Trotter comes out of the bathroom. I don't think they converse with them at all. They're just other characters, and there's other okay. like there's a there's a character called Hugh Sipes. That's that's a, another person in the bar in the screenplay that I made a note of. Oh, and and what? And I guess this is someone who we do we just don't get anymore, huh? It's it doesn't really. It's just another character. It's just another just another extra kid. perspective on gambling. Of course, he's well, like you know. he's supposed to be like kind of a bum that's in the bar. Looney says he knew Hitler and the bar and the Hugh Sipes character says, what a cocksucker. Like that's the extent. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, There's a couple lines in here may have been cut also because Looney drops another F bomb on it. And that he made me, I don't, I don't know if there's another one in the screenplay, but you know, if you have, have your too many of those, you get that R rating. Yeah. Uh, So there's some more with, Looney watching the Packers game and pe- the Packers are already losing here. Uh, ah, okay. Very good. Very good. Oh, that's great stuff. Yeah, keep that uh, keep that screenplay nearby. James. I like it. I love it, actually. All right. There's so a conversation we... about the Cleveland Indians, too, um, in the screenplay. In this scene? Between Looney and Marty, right when Evangeline and Sid walk in. It doesn't have any bearing on anything. It's, it's an easy cut. Oh, sure. I mean... Uh... I'm sure it is. Okay. So in the bathroom, we're with Trotter and on his knees in that disgusting bathroom. (laughs) Yeah. Looking up, we are looking down on him and he is, I guess, praying. I don't know. I mean, he's sort of praying. praying. You know, he's sort of praying. He's in a mode of praying. He is talking to God. He's kneeling on the toilet, praying to the porcelain God. Yes. But. But he's and, also uh, saying things like, I don't belong here with these losers. Yeah. <laughs> I, I should be in the jockey club talking to guys with all their teeth. Just, just a great, great, hilarious line. And really what he's looking for is just let me win this one. That's the deal he wants to make here, James. Is he wants to win this one. So whereas in, in the opening scene in the Chinese restaurant, he drops how, ah, oh, I'd always just, you know, just want, want to have this one day. But here, it sounds like he's just looking for this one race, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, is that how you look at it? Or, or are you looking at it as though he's asking for the entire day? I think he's just looking at the one race. Like, he, yeah. 
he feels like this is his chance to to do something good. I, I don't get the impression that he's thinking beyond that first race because when as the movie plays out, there's mm-hmm. there's a, a back and forth, there's an internal dialogue about whether he's supposed to continue, like is this where I quit? There's there's always that that question about whether I let it ride. Yes. And subsequently, someone in the bathroom as people yell out random things in the bathroom, someone just yells out, let it ride, which mm-hmm. is the first time someone has mentioned the title in, in the movie. And now we're going to be out of the bathroom. But any thoughts on somebody just randomly yelling out the movie title like that? This this particular piece of dialogue, this scene in the bathroom. Yeah. Is why I look at this and just. Richard Dreyfus is a phenomenal comedic actor. And he's, I don't know if he's ever gotten credit for how good he is. This piece of dialogue mm-hmm. in the movie really, really builds that character. Like Jay Trotter is built in the toilet at Marty's. And I've always said that this is one of Richard Dreyfuss' greatest performances. Oh, I'm so with you on that. Absolutely. It's right here. This is when I'm like, my God, he's great. When he looks up, he's yes. pleading to the toilet. He looks up and he's got, there's this pause when he, after he's pleading to the heavens. I don't belong here with these losers. You know that. I belong over in the jockey club, talking to guys with all their teeth. For this this moment, like he just wants this moment, this day, something to go right. And there's a pause. And the voice from the next stall says, so's Jesus. And that smile that he has as he's looking up from this toilet is like, it's a moment that's like perfectly in my brain it's it's been it's been branded there for all these years there's just something about that camera angle this Mm -hmm. speech and that smile and then you hear that ephemeral voice from the netherworld of the toilet going let it ride a a non-distinct it's not really coming from anywhere in particular and this is where you know i mentioned that it's sort of a spiritual movie and i'm not saying that it's it's a religious movie, but there's a belief in a, a greater power that that runs throughout the entire movie. Oh yeah, there, there most uh, unquestionably is some sort of spiritual thing that is happening in this movie. Like there's just no doubt about it in my mind as well. There's scenes like this exactly exemplify that, right? So and, and this is where where we're spo- we're we're buying into that, right? Because without the audience like going along with this sort of it's magical realism that's happening throughout this movie where i mean it's even established a little bit earlier too when he's walking in and there's a dialogue between his thoughts and the people on the street with the with the guy selling the the pamphlets and the the betting lines and the yeah, information the and, and, yes. right and they're filling he, he's filling in the thoughts like he's thinking about how much he makes per day and then he responds yes so we're sort of being brought into this this notion that that there's more to it than just face value everyday yeah, life. There's definitely something else that's going on, uh, certainly on this day. Right. Yeah, because it kind of starts when he first <laughs> when when he's talking to Looney in, in the second scene. Right. And they're, he's listening to the tape. And all of a sudden, you hear the mystical music for a, for mm-hmm. a moment, and you know he he announces it. Looney's like, what? "You look different." And he says that how he feels different, like like something has happened. It's as though his twenty four hours of magic, of whatever it is, has just begun, and he is maybe mildly aware of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was the chair. Yeah. You. I thought. No. It's you know, like. I, I, no. That's completely wrong. Well, it's like it builds, right? So yes. he, he he has the sense, like he believes in the tip, like he believes in the tape, he believes in the conversation. So the first step is believing that this is actually a fix on this race. 
Mm -hmm. Despite everyone telling, well, everyone being Looney, Looney coming up with every reason imaginable to tell him that it's not going to work. There's no way you're lucky enough to bet to be able to get this chip to bet on this horse and, and win this race. All terrible and reasons that he has. They're all terrible reasons. Yes. But we're, he, every, everything he comes up with. And just, yes. So you can see how Looney is comp just useless like he's a useless human he he makes terrible bets he's just always going to be a loser and trotter is like i am not always going to be a loser because i am going to seize my opportunity he's going to take his shot this is real this is happening he's going to let it ride over and over again so as oh. the the belief builds mm -hmm. like i can't lose i'm having and, a very good day and should should we mention the the name of the horse charity Charity. It's, the horse names are all symbolic, right? To yeah. what's going on. So this first horse, Charity, it's a gift to him. This is his way of, of you know, here's what you're looking for. Here's a little bit of charity in your life. This, not just the money, but the win. The win. Because it's not even, in the end, too, it's not even the money. It's the win. I mean, the money, the money's nice. Well, I mean, yes, that's absolutely. why we're doing it. Right. <laughs> that's why we're all here. That's why we don't just show up to the track and watch the horses run around and not bet on them. <laughs> we are here actually for the money. But it is the win that right. he's that will fill whatever is missing inside him. Whatever his oh, void yeah. is. Like it's yes. it's it that it's it's the win he needs. Yes. The money the always is secondary to the win, to to having the very good day in a life of so many bad days. So he has this very good day. And this is where I mentioned Terry Gar earlier and her importance to the movie. When she shows up in the final scene and says, I don't care about the money. She's the final piece of the puzzle, right? If she's not on board, the day is still gone sideways. His marriage is still in shambles. What is it even for? But when she shows up before the end of the race and says, the money doesn't matter. It's just where it's just money. Okay. That so, means he's 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 had everything. This is everything he want. His marriage has been repaired in you know the terms of the movie. The marriage has been repaired. He's had his day. He's won, and he's got the money. So, do you believe that when she shows up and she says that to him, because she says it just before the result of the photo finish, correct? Right. Yeah. Okay. So, do you think that's what triggers that win? right after i i don't know i hadn't thought about that until just now but i no neither had I, I i love it though i love that idea that as soon as she says that it's like okay everything is complete photo finish comes in right after and now you now trotter you've got everything that you want slash i feel like i'm gonna out myself a little bit with this with this next next statement but i get a little teary-eyed at oh, the gee. end of let it ride <laughs> Right. Like I don't cry at movies. Okay. It's, it's just kind of a, like, it, it's not, it's rare. Right. I gotcha. I gotcha. But all right. I always get a little misty at the end of let it ride. And I never understood like, what about this movie is making me feel this way until recently when I was paying super close attention. It was like, I felt like this was a mystery. Why do I get emotional at the end of a movie about gambling? Okay, so right. what is the answer? It is Terry Gar. Like when she shows up and yeah. she's the hot mess throughout the movie, she's yelling at him about the money and the gambling, and I can't stand it. And when she shows up, mostly kind of sober again after having her, her midday bender because her husband is back at the track and gambling again. Yes. And she shows up and has given him total acceptance without having any clue about the money and the timing is important because she can't give it after the race has concluded and it's like it wasn't about the money well okay now that you have the money it doesn't have to be about the money but when she's looking at him and it, she says it's not about the money doesn't matter it's not even that's the final piece like i say like the win is great the win without her approval and the you know, the conclusion of the relationship drama, the, the reparation is still pretty empty. Like as fun as the movie is, it's still missing that piece, but it's when she comes back and joins him again and they're looking at each other and 
he's not thinking about the money and she's not thinking about the money. And then he wins. And then it's just like the capper on the perfect day. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you already know he intends to go back to her no matter what happens. He already turned right. down Vicky. Yeah, he, he had that opportunity. And he no, I, I still in love I love my wife. wife. Right. So I need to put aside yeah. some money. He gave her the, the gift of the, the jewelry expecting yes. to not have the money later. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> okay, so the, the very next thing or the only thing left in this scene is where we have everyone being surprised that uh, Evangeline is only, she's only 19. And then she has her, her bracelet is uh, caught in her, or her, her necklace, necklace, I should say. I'm sorry. Stuck in her her necklace is stuck in her braces. bracelet. Yeah. And uh, Sid, Sid very lovingly, like the way he takes it out of her mouth is almost touching if it's not a little creepy i don't know it's 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 somewhere that teeters in between those two things i think it is it is a it's a it's a quick moment and cynthia nixon is is pretty great in her limited time that that she gets in this movie and you could see there there's certainly more to her as an actress oh yeah i mean she'd already been been doing it for for quite a while even at this point from i don't know little darlings or or 10, yeah. 88 or, and you know, you know, if you look out through the 80s, you'll, you'll find her in a number of places. I would say that she's probably a sort of a seasoned actress at this point already. And, yeah, she, playing doesn't, this. and she doesn't have a, a heck of a lot to do. But, yeah, she makes the impression, uh, you know. She, when I, yeah. And, and this first scene, it, it is a little strange when you when when Mar- when Sid brings her in and she's clearly super young. And like you said, it's it's sort of creepy, but but also kind of sweet he seems to actually really have affection for her and has just brought her along on his you know his day of gambling and this yes. is new for her and and they're just having fun together and the the movie doesn't you know judge him i mean the characters make comments but the movie doesn't judge their relationship whatever whatever right yeah here. And, and i kind of wonder like how old are we supposed to think sid is i'm not even sure because he could it's be any, right? It's it's unclear, right? I don't think he's forty. He's clearly younger no. than all of the I other think he's guys. Probably old, like around. late twenties, maybe. That, but I mean, still, a, yep. the gap yep. is old is is enough that you're like, well, that's a little, yes. a little weird. And they play up how much of a like a juvenile she appears with the braces and getting. Oh, she, oh for sure, yeah. She's and, surprised she's not in yeah. pigtails. Club uh, soda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that is that is it. That is the end of this scene. You got anything else that you would like to add to this, James, that you could think of that we didn't discuss, that we didn't go over? In the screenplay, we can go back to that for a second. It's this character named Sid Booten tries to buy her a beer. In that, Wait, you mean there's another character named Sid that's in this scene? Sid, well, so the character has changed. Oh, okay. In, I mean, the last name's not given in the movie as far as I know. Maybe it is. Yeah. It, I, I kind of differentiate the Sid that's in the movie from the Sid here because the Sid here is greasy and kind of creepy. <laughs> okay. He's wearing, it's it's written in that he's a skinny wimp in a shark skin suit. Oh, I, you know, that's a little like what Sid sort of looks like. Like I could sort see of. that, right? Yeah. It sounds like they, they toned down they what they Sid they really put a mute on what Sid was going to be because he tries to buy her a beer, and he's wearing a bunch of Indian jewelry. Like it's it's oh boy, it's pretty over the top. And and in the screenplay, it's creepy. Okay, so we can be glad for these changes. Yes. Uh, so because okay. I sound like I'm happy about it. I feel like these these are good changes. Uh, yes, these are the, good changes. toning this character down, having him be was kind of unnecessary like he doesn't have a major role so make so putting like even if it's you know if you're making a more interesting character for a much deeper evolution of his story maybe maybe this makes sense but he he doesn't have time for any of that and and otherwise it's a distraction so now we can go well it's kind of sweet and kind of creepy and here it's just really creepy that's correct yeah so we can the the changes in i'm all rather unclear about how much paramount looked in and said you know this Nancy Dowd's screenplay really needs some some tightening up, chopping up here, toned down here, and, and how much is the the collaborative effort, the creative effort to make this a tighter 
more forward looking movie rather than getting bogged down and because the, the the screenplay really gets into the the dialogue a little bit heavier it, it falls in love with itself sometimes the cleverness of the dialogue and the changes in the remove the what's removed is is good removing that opening scene with the gambling meeting is is a good change for the movie's momentum and maybe for the tone of the movie too Oh, yeah, I, I definitely think so. I definitely think so. It all of a sudden feels a little too real. I mean, we're actually going into a Gamblers Anonymous meeting and we're, we're dealing with Gamblers Anonymous rules that I was not aware of. You know, when, when in that first scene, he's talking about things, you know, how has gambling affected your reputation, which comes up later on in the Jockey Club when he's talking to Michelle Phillips. And I always thought that was such an interesting question that he asks her, and then when I saw that first scene, and I see, oh, that's like an actual Gamble's Anonymous thing to discuss that. That's a question. That's part of mm-hmm. their methodology. So because this movie is somewhat spiritual or somewhat a fantasy or whatever it is, I think keeping that, that tight realism is something that we want to move away from. I'm I'm okay with it being a DVD extra, even though I do like that scene. Like watching it, I was yeah. On its own, the the dialogue is is still pretty sharp, but it's it's not the movie this turned out to be. Yeah, and that's bringing it back to the grinding reality of gambling addiction. It's 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 not that's not this movie. That's clean and sober. That's that's not let it ride. Absolutely, absolutely, and. Uh, Going back to, I mean, that's I think really why this movie stands out is because we're not lectured about it. Like it's it's not it's not the scared straight that most of these addiction movies are. Mm-hmm. Yes, no, it's you know th- there's a book that I was looking up about. God, I cannot think of what it is called at this moment in time, but it is about movies that deal with gambling, and this one is in there, and it's like this is the worst movie because it does all of the wrong things. It encourages all of the wrong things. <laughs> and I totally understand that. I get and, that perspective. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it makes perfect sense. If you were somebody who was affected by gambling, I could understand you look at this movie and, and being offended by it. Like, that that makes perfect sense. But uh, it's still, I don't know. Is it wrong that it's still fun, James? Is it wrong? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> it's not wrong to have fun in a movie. Okay. If, uh, Thank you. you know. <laughs> Thank you for, for alleviating my guilt that occasionally pops up. Right. It, it is something I, I thought about. I think anybody who loves this movie has at some point taken into consideration, well, am I not supposed to love this movie? Yes. Because it does glorify the gambling. Yes. We get it. I guess what I'm saying is it's not, I don't love it because it's about gambling. Oh, no, not at all, right? No, you, you love it because of, I don't know, everything else. It is, it is everything. Like here, and, you know, it, it's, it was a bunch of, you know, Jay Cron- Cronley wrote a book, right? And it is mm-hmm. unlike the movie. But it is like the movie, right? I mean, it, it, it is as much as a blueprint for what would come. And I know that he had reservations and, and said some things about Joe Pitka that was like, this is not exactly what I would have done. It was like, no, this is not what you have done. But Joe Pitka turned your excellent book into a slightly different, but also excellent movie. 100%. And and Cronley was looking at this more realistically. I mean, the book is funny. It is. But there's more of that realism. Oh, for sure. Like, he's really into what makes everyone here tick and for better and worse it, it's the the gamblers the the sport the the people who work there like he's really into all that goes into making horse racing what it is mm-hmm. and yeah the movie does you know it touches on that in a much lighter way and i mean i i don't know if i want good vibes adapted straight <laughs> you you, you probably don't. <laughs> you probably so don't. while it's, it's I can see his reser- yeah, I can see his reservations about not wanting the guy who directed, uh, you know, the Michael Jackson Pepsi commercial doing his book because that's his book. It's very personal to him saying, 
you're giving it to Joe Pick, a guy who's never directed a movie before, and his claim to fame is directing commercials and music videos. I can I can um, tell you I I talked to Jay, and he told me that he met Pitka, and this is <laughs> this is what he told me. He said, "Yeah, so I met Pitka, and this guy's like Conan the director, and <laughs> and he says to me, I don't want your book getting in the way of my movie, and I thought, okay, I'm out of here. That's how he described it to me, <laughs> which I thought. Oh. Okay. That's pretty amusing. I do like that interaction. Oh, yes, yes, it's great. I've I've got it somewhere. I will have to dig it up, even though I'm not going to like how I sound on it. But that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> it was like 2006. Anyway, uh, James, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for visiting the Jockey Club, a look at the movie Let It Ride, one scene at a time. This episode was hosted, produced, and edited by me, Dan Delgado, and my guest was James David Patrick. Check out James's own podcast, Cinema Shame, wherever you get your podcast. Music in this episode is from Epidemic Sound, and our podcast cover art is by Sean Labrie. If you enjoyed this episode, and I certainly hope you did, well, then you can feel free to leave us a review wherever it is that you can. Now, when I say leave a review, I mean a, a nice positive review. It may or may not help the show get noticed, but it will definitely make me feel good inside. Or better yet, you could just tell another Let It Ride fan about it. You could contact me through email if you want. It's dan at moviemaker.com. I am on Twitter at underscore dan underscore Delgado. Or even better, I'm on the Repod app, which is a fantastic way to not only to listen to podcasts, but to interact with podcast hosts like me. Find it in your app store and come by and say hello. And again, thanks for listening. <laughs>